mean, I think bushwalking is popular in all of Australia, but especially Tasmania because more than 50% of that island is covered in protected land, whether it's a national park or a protected zone. And so Tasmanians really like to take these areas in by foot. Well, and again, it's culture, right? It's active town culture. It's it like is, absolutely. This, do in Tasmania. They go on bushwalks. Well, how yeah. can we use that to help the environment? Because this yeah. is also a culture that's being plagued with bushfires. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Simmerman, and that is Jamie Moyer. Uh, Jamie lives up in Nelson, British Columbia. Uh, she's a friend of mine. I've known her for quite a few years, and she is a journalist. She's an adventure journalist. Uh, she's an active culture journalist, and I am absolutely delighted to share this conversation with you. So let's get right to it with Jamie Moyer. Jamie, it's so wonderful to have you on the Active Towns podcast. Uh, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> so, Jamie, you and I know each other from uh, our time in Boulder. We both lived there for a little bit. And uh, and a friend actually suggested that I reach out to you uh, because you are a writer. You're a journalist. Uh, so <laughs> just take a moment to tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Sure thing. So that flash you just saw was this jumping into my lap. <laughs> the co-star. <laughs> That's my dog. Um, yes, I'm a journalist. I specialize in mountain sports and culture, active travel, a little bit of adventure here and there. Uh, my primary medium is writing these days, but I've also done a little bit of work in podcast journalism as well and hope to be doing some more work in the future in storytelling through film. Ah, very cool. Very cool. And in fact, the last time we saw each other was in Boulder a few years ago uh, at the, what was it, the Adventure Film Festival or something like that? What was that, the name of that? Yeah, that must have been a couple years ago, like at least four. Just yeah, everything before the pandemic is a bit of a blur. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, well, tell us a little bit about where where are you actually located? So I am just about 45 minutes across Washington State's northern border in a small mountain town in Canada in British Columbia called Nelson. Ah, okay, cool. I'm going to pull that up right here. Oh, uh, yeah, there, there we are. There we are. Yeah. We're, so we're on the, uh, the, what's called the West arm of Kootenay Lake. That's what you're right. seeing there. There's Kootenay Lake. Yeah. Yep. And we are nestled in the Selkirk mountains, which is a sub range of the Columbia mountains. Fantastic. Yeah. And I see the state line is down here. The country line, excuse me, the, the, the border, <laughs> the, the quote unquote border. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> How did you end up there? What a wild and wonderful place. Yes, I, uh, wild and wonderful is a great word for it. Um, so I was in Boulder, Colorado for 18 years. Um, and I met there in Boulder a Canadian man. And I got him to fall in love with me. <laughs> it sounds like that was like a, a, a quest or a challenge. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I didn't know it at the time because that was way before Donald Trump got elected. But kind of once that happened, I was like, whoa, this this is my ticket north. And I didn't even know. So thank goodness I laid that groundwork way ahead of time. Um, now I, I joke about that. I We did move right after Trump took office um, in, right. in 2017. But it really was just part of a larger life plan. I mean, he was pretty clear about not wanting to retire in the U.S., um, wanting to be in Canada where we had better access to health care and just, just some different government supports that are available in Canada that aren't in the U.S. And uh, also, I think we were both craving a change from Boulder. Um, we've yeah. both been there almost 20 years, and we're ready for just something a little bit smaller, a little bit more low-key. And so it's just the time was right for a move to Canada. And we wanted to do it sooner rather than later. We didn't want to wait until retirement to do it. 
We wanted to go and establish ourselves in a community, build a support of friendships um, before we were in retirement age. So yeah. at that time yeah. I was in and here's, early. And here's a nice photo of the, of the group here. <laughs> yes, that is my husband, Jean-Francois, and that is our daughter, Sophie. Fantastic. And, and, our, and our fur baby, too. <laughs> and uh, Fozzie Bear. Yeah, Fozzie Bear. <laughs> so we're all together. We've got the whole family uh, kind of gathered around here. What, what's going on here? That is my Canadian family. Yeah, so they're Jean-Francois's parents. They're originally from Quebec, and they live in British Columbia now, too, um, also in uh-huh. Nelson. And we are celebrating in that photo. Um, two days ago, I took my citizenship oath which is the last official step in becoming a Canadian citizen. Yeah. And uh, I think we even have, yeah, here, here, here you are. You're, you're actually going through the motions here, or not the motions. You're actually going through the process. And, and this is funny, too, because uh, you can actually hear in the background the, uh, everybody, you know, the, the person who's prompting the, the oath and then everybody else who's in it. So it, it sounds like it was sort of a group swearing in or, or the oath. Oh, yeah. There was 128 people on that call with me, all who were also becoming new Canadian citizens. And we spanned 39 different countries. And so wow. normally these ceremonies are done in person, but COVID changed that. Um, and also there's been such a backlog of processing since the pandemic that it's just mm-hmm. been easier and more efficient to keep doing them online. And so that's what we're doing right now in Canada. And uh, it was really fun to be able to see if you're familiar with like the Zoom format, right? Where you see that gallery mode where you can see all of the 128 other people who are on the call with you. And you get yeah. that like little glimpse into their lives that you wouldn't get if you were all in like a convention center together. So you can see like what part of their house they're sitting in or what background they've chosen to show. Like a lot of people had American flags. They had their family surrounding them. So it was, it's a different way of doing it. Um, but it was still really nice. Yeah. Well, speaking of backgrounds, I, I noticed somebody in the background of this photo. Who's that? <laughs> that is prime minister, Justin Trudeau. He made a cameo appearance um, by <laughs> video to welcome um, all 128 new Canadian citizens on the Zoom session that morning. Yeah, fantastic! Well, congratulations! That is fa- absolutely fantastic. Uh, so, I, I'm I'm assuming this is dual citizenship. You don't have to uh, give up your uh, U.S. Uh, citizenship. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. So the U.S. has a relationship with Canada where it allows dual citizenship. And that, you know, that varies by country to country. But Canada and U.S., definitely you can hold dual. Okay. 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 So we talked about Boulder. You'd been in Boulder for uh, nearly two decades. Uh, Where were you at before that? I was born and raised. Yeah, I was born and raised in the U.S. Midwest in a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio. Ah, which one? Which suburb? It's called Mentor. Okay. But if you're from there, you say mentor. Got it. The word looks like it's spelled mentor, but it's we cut mentor is how we say. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's uh, I, I'm not familiar with that particular area, uh, but I did. There, I think there was a there's a suburb or a section of of, uh, of that that area that is famous for the kids uh, walk or bike to school. They have no school buses. And so it's a really neat feature of, of that particular, you know, community, the whole school district. They, everybody walks and, and bikes to school, no school buses and no, and nobody, uh, no, no parents carting the, the kids to school either. So. I love that. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You no, know, like in retrospect, I think I kind of felt a little bit like that wasn't, you know, growing up that way, it wasn't a great fit for the type of town I ultimately wanted to be in, which I think is why I moved to Boulder, Colorado, right after finishing university. Granted, my entire family's there, so it was really hard to leave. But um, I just I look at the place where I grew up as a, um, I call it more of a passive sports town. People are really involved in sports, but more as spectators. And more as like ball sports. Um, and this is not to say there are not amazing pockets of 
outdoor activity and activeness in the Cleveland area because there are. But, you know, 40 years ago, it just it wasn't what my family culture did. Um, so it's been interesting because I moved to Boulder to get more of that active component in my life, that outdoor lifestyle. And then going back to Ohio, to the Cleveland area as an adult, now that that's kind of in my blood, if you will, I now see it, whereas I didn't see it as a kid. So I'm like, wow, the entire Cleveland area is surrounded in these metro parks, we call them, which is an mm-hmm. absolute treasure to have these incredible green spaces with just miles and miles of trail running or in the winter, you know, it's cross country skiing and there's definitely like an active road bike community. There's, you know, Ironman triathlons, like all the things I sort of thought I discovered in Boulder, like they exist back home too. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's funny how, yeah, sometimes life just comes full circle and you're like, yeah, Oh, yeah, yeah. there too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Let's, let's pull up an image or two of, of the, the Nelson kind of area here. Uh, gosh, uh, a little bit idyllic or what? <laughs> yes, that's my town. This was actually taken, this picture was taken a few days ago. Oh, maybe last week, um, by a friend of mine, Adrian Wagner. He's Adrian Wagner studios. If you want to follow him on Instagram, but yeah, this is just a shot of, of our downtown Nelson. We're about 10,000 people, and you can see there we've got like some foothills behind us. So those are the Selkirk Mountains. Um, We're covered in mostly cedar hemlock forests. We're an inland temperate rainforest. Topic I would love to talk to you about more about later if you want to talk about what that means. Um, Mm -hmm. We get an average of 400 feet of snow per year. Wow, that is amazing. Oh, I might have said that. Sorry, 400 inches, 40 right. feet. <laughs> yeah, I think I knew what you meant. Yeah, yeah. 400 feet would be, uh, would be uh, you, you, you couldn't even ski on it. So, but 400 inches, yes, that makes plenty of sense. <laughs> there you go. And, and who's that? Yeah, that's me. That's about the same time um, last year. So this is, um, that's Weimer Peak in the background, which is, that's the really charismatic peak that backs our ski resort. And I'm just up a little bit outside of the resort boundaries there. We have great backcountry that's accessible right from the resort. And so it's really a fun part of the culture here is both having that ski resort 20 minutes from town, but then also having that amazing backcountry access. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And uh, I never knew that about you, that you were a a bit of a powder hound. So when I lived in Colorado, (laughs) that's what I lived for in the wintertime. Well, it's funny. I got into it later in life. I was Mm -hmm. not a confident or competent skier most of the time that I lived in Colorado. And it's funny because I think in hindsight, it was like, well, if you're trying to pick up backcountry skiing in Colorado, like you're going to, or at least me, you're going to Berthoud Pass, which is like you're at 10,000 feet. And then you're skinning uphill where you start at 10,000 feet. And it's just, I'm like, this, it is incredibly hard. And just that sort of barrier to entry because it was so cardio, cardiovascularly challenging, I think was a big thing. Yeah. So moving here to Nelson, um, we are just at lower elevation in general. And so you're accessing the backcountry at 2000 feet instead of 10,000 feet. And so it, it I think that got me over that hurdle that I was yeah. really struggling with in Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. Is this, the whole family? That is Jean Francois, um, our daughter Sophie, our son Felix is not in the photo, but that is Sophie's best friend Tegan. So, Got it. super close family friend. And this is all of us skiing together. Yeah, last year, right around the same time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, we're up in the backcountry just, just above Whitewater Ski Resort. Hmm. Yeah. I, I lo- what, what a great asset to have, you know, for the community is that ability for families to be able to, uh, be able to recreate together, be able to have that active lifestyle, that culture of activity. And you and I had talked a little bit about this before. In fact, I think we even talked about it, uh, back in Boulder is, is this concept of communities that are able to establish a culture of activity where culture, their activity just sort of permeates through all aspects of life, you know, and it's not uncommon for like, I used to joke and say that, yeah, I'd be 
you know, out on the trails and in, in the middle of the day, uh, they're in Boulder and then, you know, folks would come by on like their gravel bikes or whatever. And they're like having a team meeting, you know, this is like a break in their work day and they're doing work, but they're out recreating and getting physical activity and connecting with nature. And these are all things that are, are so, uh, essential for healthy lifestyles and, and well-being is for humans to be able to get physical activity in, but also more importantly, get physical activity in, in nature. Yes, so much. And, you know, I was really fortunate in that with my job, I work from home and so does my husband. He's a software architect. And so when, when we were making the move from Boulder, we had a lot of choice in terms of where do we want to relocate to? And we knew British Columbia. We, we know we're mountain people. Um, and, you know, if you're a mountain person, that's, that's the spot in Canada. So the question was which community within British Columbia? And so we could look exactly at those types of things. Like what is the level of participation in mountain sports and culture with the general community? And how, you know, how is that? How does that play out in terms of the businesses that are here, the people that choose to live here? Because that's all part of it, right? You know, what's the infrastructure that's there to support it? And those decisions start becoming kind of nuanced too. And you're like, okay, you love the snow, you know that. But there's questions like, well, are you looking for a Nordic ski community? Are you looking for a downhill community, a backcountry community? Um, do you like more of the ritzy, glamorous ski resort lifestyle? Do you like a more low key under the radar ski resort lifestyle? And, you know, let's face it, like most people can't choose that to the level we were able to, but we yeah. were and such an incredible opportunity. And so Nelson really is like very, we could fine tune our requirements and find the place that best matched it. And that's what we got with Nelson. Yeah. And it's, it enables an incredible quality of life. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, speaking of, of culture, you, you, you pointed out a, a video that, uh, you know, kind of exemplifies just the, a little bit of the spirit of, uh, and fun, you know, there's a sense of fun. And this kind of reminds me of some of uh, the Colorado mountain towns that I'm familiar with, like Crested Butte and, and some of the other, you know, not the big ski resorty kinds of places, but where there's this like sensation of fun. And so this kid's, you know, uh, <laughs> being carted off to school and he'd much <laughs> rather be try to get to school like this person is <laughs> and uh we will pay the whole thing but i'll i'll be sure to have the uh the link uh to this video in the show notes and in the video description below uh so that folks can watch it and it's got a really good soundtrack too so you'll, you'll want to definitely watch it and hear the 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 entire video because mom and dad are in there just kind of they're almost like the penis wah, 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 wah. <laughs> and, and the kids just like he's enthralled by this this you know adventure kind of really cool thing going on and i it was just it's so much fun to watch and then they finally get to school and then there's all these other kids that are like being trapped in these metal boxes getting to school and they're having these same sort of visions of all these other like matching uh, you know, skiers, adventure skiers showing up to school at the same time. Hey, that's how I want to get to school. <laughs> I love it that you called out this particular film because this film, Imagination, um, it's by Sherpa Cinema, actually, which is based also in British Columbia and Whistler. This film dropped in 2017, that winter. So that was my first winter living in Nelson. It's filmed entirely in Nelson. Like, this is my town. And this film so perfectly captures the soul of this community that it, it, it brings, every time I watch it, I actually tear up. I'm like, this is why I live here. Yeah. And we do have, like, we have this really hilly kind of community. Like, this, the town kind of comes up from the water. And so you've got that the steepness that you're seeing where this guy's just ripping along. And yeah, your description's great. I mean, this film was probably made mostly by people my age. Um, it was the original vision of J.P. Eau Claire, who's a really, really beloved 
iconic ski industry person who unfortunately passed away in an avalanche a couple years before this film was made um, in Chile in like 2015. But this is actually his idea because this is how kids in Nelson grow up. Like, yeah, you're going to school and like mom and dad are blabbing on and you're in the backseat of the car. And you notice like the vintage like station wagon, right? With like the wood paneling. Cause like, that's how we grew up, right? In our generation. And JP Eau Claire was actually in our generation as well. I mean, he's maybe plus or minus five, minus five years off of me. But anyways, that's what we did, right? Like, and we just, what if we were actually, you know, zooming over those hills that were passing, those big mounds of snow in people's driveways. And yeah, I love the finale at the end where they pull up into the school and you realize like every single other kid being driven to school is having the same fantasy. And all of a sudden you have like all the skiers are out there. You're like, you're seeing inside the imagination of all those kids. And yeah. I love it. And our school, you know, it's not untypical. Is that a word? It's not atypical for when the ski resort opens, like there's a lot of kids there. So it's usually on a Friday and people pull their kids out of school for that. And then when you do get to the high school level or what we call secondary school in Canada, like we have an entire program. It's called Atlas for kids, or I should say teenagers by that point, who are interested in pursuing careers or, um, you know, other passions in the outdoors, whether that's through guiding or tourism and they go and they learn, you know, they get their avalanche skills training certification and they learn how to rock climb, how to belay. All those things become part of their high school curriculum. So that's very much a core community value is our mountain sports and culture. And I love how that film gets to the soul of that. Yeah. And speaking of culture, so in fact, that is the name of the magazine. The, you know, you're out up, up there in the Kootenay there, and you've got the Kootenay uh, Mountain Culture Magazine. And uh, you're, this is, this is the, uh, the, the group that you're, you're writing with. Is that correct? One of them. That's correct. And the existence of this magazine, the fact that it's based out of Nelson, was one of the reasons we decided to to live in Nelson. I mean, there's other great towns in the Kootenay region. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of Revelstoke, for example. Um, right. But the fact that Kootenay Mountain Culture was here in Nelson, I was like, oh, that's a huge plus. Um, so to be in the same community as the team behind this magazine, it is a world-class magazine. It's published <laughs> out of passion. This is not making anyone rich, but it's been around for 20 years. And the stories and photography in it are just absolutely top notch. And I love working with and writing for this magazine. Um, I think the cover you've got up on the screen, that's the winter issue that just dropped in November. And part of what Kootenay Mountain Culture does is it's also, oh, it produces content for you no know, tourism, for example, would be a, an example or, yeah. you know, other other local like-minded businesses who are doing things in the same, in the vein of Kootenay Mountain culture. So. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, you sent along a few images here and this, this sort of kind of opens up the window into a, a little bit of the, the type of journalism that you do. And w would you describe this as the, 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 the genre of your journal journalism, sort of adventure journalism and adventure travel journalism, something like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I sometimes just like loosely group it into saying mountain sports and culture and mm -hmm. that travel, it's, it's happening right in my own community. So there's like, like a wide scope for that. But it's, yeah, if it's something that has to do with mountain sports and culture, it's usually something that I like to cover. And Kootenay Mountain Culture specifically is a really nice snapshot of that here in my hometown, in my home region. And those, the stories, I think I have three in the latest issue. I'm a senior writer with the magazine. Those stories really exemplify the type of writing I like to do. And, you know, all three of them are actually about people if you break it down right like they're doing interesting or adventurous things whether that's in you know for one group one of them it's culinary arts for another one it's sailboats for another one it's backcountry ski touring but it's ultimately about the people who are doing these interesting or, or quirky things yeah and another place I, I end up seeing your your writing from time to time is in fact adventure journal 
talk a little bit about this uh, this particular one. And these are beautiful, by the way. I love I love it when they arrive here at the house here in Austin. Oh, I know. Me too. Steve Casimiro does an amazing job with that magazine. And, you know, these, it's interesting, and this is a tangent, but these are the types of magazines that are surviving, right? These, you know, in Adventure Journal's case, it, it covers adventure all over the world, but it's this beautifully produced, long-form narrative writing, stories that really move you, like at a, at a heart level, at a gut level. Um, and Kootenai Mountain Culture is like that too, but just at a hyper-local level. So with Adventure Journal, I tend to publish in there like some of my international stories. And the cover you chose is one of my all-time favorites because it was for the story that took place in China in the Altai Mountains, um, which is where that cover shot is from. Yeah, and here are some photos from this, just kind of flipping through. Uh, and it looks like we've got a little skiing going on here in China here. <laughs> Yes, I was really lucky to be part of the first commercial ski tour in the Altai Mountains from the China side. Um, this is in the Xinjiang province. And one of the guides in our group is a, is a young Chinese man who was actually living in New Zealand at the time, but he came back to China for this trip. And he's a paraglider and he likes to do it from skis. So he went and did a, a paragliding descent from the top of the mountain. And then he looked back and filmed each of us coming down. So that's actually, it was me in that last one, the one that kind of cut over Yeah, and went for the fresh powder on the other end, that, that was me coming down. <laughs> you know, part of the fun of experiencing other mountain cultures is, you yeah. know, jump into the, well, you've got a shot up right now of me in a, a ridiculous fur hat. Um, and, you know, and I don't, I don't wear fur as a practice, but when it's part of the culture, you're sort of trying that on right. for a bit. And, and you're like, wow, these are really warm. And the temperature there is usually like negative 10 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So we are skiing in some of the coldest conditions I've ever been in. And you suddenly understand, oh, this is what fur was meant to be Exactly. For. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and here's a little fellow. And, yeah. I love seeing like, well, what are the types of dogs that people have in these yeah. places? You know, we're in a, a village called Himu. You know, this is somebody's dog. He actually belonged to um, the owner of the sort of the cafe that we were all hanging out at that day, which you can kind of see in the background. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And that's the village and, we were sitting in. Wow. Wow. And, and just, this guy, uh, a Chana driver. Chanas yeah, are the wood plays they pull behind the horse's pole, which is how they used to get around from village to village before roads were put into those places. Hmm. Mm. we've got also like the the way skiing was traditionally done there is you go and you cut down a tree and you shape it and you put horse hair on the bottom as skins which gives you that traction on the uphill but doesn't prevent you from going down on the downhill um they weren't really downhilling in those skis they were more for transportation to just kind of right. get up in the trees and do do the hunting more or less um yeah yeah talk about active transportation Exactly. Um, but so that story ended up being a feature in uh, that issue of Adventure Journal, which was published maybe two, two or three years ago. Yeah. yeah. Definitely pre-pandemic, I think right before the pandemic. But yeah. And it, it was um, it was a mountain guide here in Nelson who kind of cued me into that. Uh, she said, you know, the longer I've been in this business, the more I realize it's about the people. And she mm -hmm. had become really drawn to experiencing other cultures of the world that were also mountain cultures. So we have a certain mountain culture here in the Kootenay region of British Columbia, but what are mountain cultures like in other parts of the world? And so she was the one who had organized that trip. And it was really fun to, to look at things through that lens. What's mountain culture like here? And that's really what I was exploring on that trip and in that article. Yeah, yeah. And then we have another more recent trip that you have, have recently done, uh, you went to Slovenia. I did. So the We Are a Mountain Nation is set in Slovenia. That was a trip I did this summer. And that story appeared in the latest issue of Adventure Journal. There's a whole backstory to why exactly I was in Slovenia. And I don't know how much you want me to tell you, but <laughs> in a nutshell, I, I'm Slovenian. Oh, Wow. Fantastic. And I told you that I 
almost showed up there in Slovenia uh, for an international um, uh, conference. The, the, the Velo City uh, conference was actually being held there in June. And it turned out that if I had attended that, you were also there in June. Yes, that's correct. That would have been amazing to rendezvous in, in the mountains of Slovenia. <laughs> now, I wouldn't have been in the mountains. I would have been in that little, that particular city there where the conference was being held. But I certainly would have pinged you and said, uh, by the way, <laughs> pop on down. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, oh. I grew up with you know, some elements of Slovenian culture. So few people know this, but Cleveland, Ohio has the largest settlement of Slovenians outside of Slovenia. Yeah. And yeah. I know that's so random, like why Cleveland, Ohio, but it was, it all happened like in the very early 1900s. I'm talking even before World War I. It's just, there was, it was perceived there was more opportunity there. Um, yeah. um, this is the Pittsburgh, Cleveland areas, just working in the factories more or less. Yeah. Um, people started coming and they didn't stop. And then I think World War One hit, you know, in like, what was it, 1913? And so people ended up maybe staying longer than they had planned on staying. And so you know, at one time you had 50,000 Slovenian immigrants land, living in Cleveland. And that's where all four of my mom's grandparents came to Slovenia, you know, at different points in their teens. They all met in the Cleveland area got married, started having kids. So my grandparents on my mom's side are both first generation Americans born to Slovenians. Wow. But by the time like my mom's generation came, you know, that was post World War One, post World War Two. And by that point, like my mom's generation, they didn't have any contact back yeah. with people still living in Slovenia and they didn't even speak the language anymore. Right. So the way I grew up with it was more Things that my grandmother would make during the holidays, yeah. like she'd make pizza or krofa. And so basically my impression of Slovenia growing up is this is a really unhealthy country where people ate a lot of baked goods, a lot of fried dough and, um, oh, Slovenian sausage. That was like a main staple. So I'm like, okay, yeah. sausage and really good doughy fried desserts with a lot of sugar on them. Yeah. I mean, not really my place. And, you know, then I moved to Boulder, Colorado, right out of university and just kind of really lost touch with my ancestral heritage on my mom's side. And it wasn't until moving to British Columbia that I learned that Slovenia is a mountain nation. I didn't even know Slovenia had mountains. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I was blown away by the photography in that issue when, when it came. I was like, Whoa, look at this. And and plus, I was also um, able to see some of your posts on social media as well. The scenes that you were capturing and sharing. And, and I think you were even saying at the time, it's like, I'm blown away. This is amazing. Yeah, I had no idea. I mean, most people don't even know where Slovenia is. I yeah, mean, I had to look it up. <laughs> right. It's bordered by Austria on the north. Italy on the northeast, you have the the sea right along there, the Dalmatian coast that goes down into Croatia. And then it, the eastern side borders Hungary. So it's kind of nestled right in there. And it's about the entire country is about the size of New Jersey. You've got about two million people. And it's part the Julian Alps run through there. So pretty much like the north and west parts of the country are the Julian Alps. And people there are serious about their mountains. Like yeah. Oh, there you go. That's a great map. Thank you. The um, So just, yep. Perfect. And look, look how little the coast is of Slovenia. Yeah, it's all yeah. hugged up by Italy. It's like surrounded by Italy on that part of the coast. But um, yeah. And then the main city there, that's where the uh, the conference was. Yeah. Ljubljana, which is a yeah. beautiful capital. There's like a castle on a hill. A river runs through it. It's yeah. all the things you love about Europe without some of the things that you don't, you know, yeah. like without the overcrowding and um, Ljubljana is a really clean city. Yeah. Anyways, I digress. The mountains though, um, there's a peak there called Triglav and it's the national symbol of Slovenia. It's on their flag. It's on their coat of arms. It's on their 50 cent Euro coin. 
And when Slovenia got in its independence from Yugoslavia in 1991, the then president said it is a duty of every Slovenian to climb Triglav at least once in their lifetime. Okay. And that's what the story delves into. Like, what drives a country to climb a mountain? What is it about Slovenians or about this mountain that it's such an important thing? And so that's what I went there to find out. And in the process, of course, I, I climbed Triglav myself. So it was just a really significant, yeah. significant trip with me. And the fact that it was photographed, you know, while we were there by Liam Morgan. He's a really close family friend. He's my daughter's boyfriend. My family was there with me, you know, Jean-Francois, both the kids. So it was an yeah. incredible trip. And here's the cover uh, to that particular edition. So uh, issue. Uh, are people able to uh, purchase e- even like the back issues? Do, the, do they have those available? If, uh, if folks who are uh, tuning in and watching this and listening to this, if they want to get a copy of issue number 26. Yeah, Adventure Journal sells all their back issues on their website. I will Mm -hmm. say, though, they tend to sell out. um, It might be possible my family, because I have over 100 cousins on the Slovenian side of my family back in the Cleveland area, may have bought them all out. So you should get on there quick to look. (laughs) (laughs) So rush. (laughs) Don't dawdle. Get on over there. (laughs) Check it out. So earlier uh, you had alluded to and, and talked a little bit about the trees and the forests and Talk, talk a little bit about what you're passionate about in, in terms of, of the trees and what's really, really unique about your area in terms of the type of forest. Sure, I would love to. Well, I think anytime you move to a new place or even when you go visit a new place, one of the most fun things to do is notice how are things in your natural outdoor environment different from back home, Right. And that starts for me anyways, usually with the trees, you know, what it's like to go to, say, Florida and see palm trees. It's like, wow. But one of the things I noticed is the trees in British Columbia are really different from the trees in Colorado. And so I wanted to learn more about that. And one of the first things I noticed was in the wintertime. In Colorado, it's very windy, right? So we don't have those evergreen trees just caked in snow usually because the wind blows all that off. But here they stick around. So you've got really like the ultimate Christmas tree is here in British Columbia, just the big giant evergreen tree, just caked iced in snow, if you will. So I wanted to know more about the forests here. And in the Kootenay region of British Columbia, we have what's called an inland temperate rainforest. And you may have heard the term temperate rainforest before, but in terms of coastal temperate rainforests, right? So we see those like coast of British Columbia. There's a lot of attention given to some of those big old growth trees recently. There is a a lot of protests happening against the logging of old growth trees in areas like Berry Creek. So I was interested to find out, well, we actually have temperate rainforest here in interior BC too, inland though, which is actually really rare. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Um, There may be some pockets of it, like in Russia, for example, but not much at all. And it used to be a whole arc, like 400 million acres of land just coming down from arcing across BC and kind of dipping into like Washington, Idaho, Montana a little bit too. And what's so cool about these forests, why they're rainforests is because they basically stay wet all year, even in the summer. But unlike most rainforests, it's not because of rain, it's because of snow. So it's almost like a better name for these forests would be snow forests. I think I said we get 400 inches of snow a year in British Colum- or in Nelson, British Columbia. A little further north in Revelstoke, they hold the record for the most amount of snowfall in a single winter. You want to you guess how many inches? Ooh, gosh, I'm going to double that, like 800? Yeah. You're good. Yeah. 800 inches mm. of snow. 80 feet of snow fell in Revelstoke. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's why we have these inland temperate rainforests. And what you get is just beautiful evergreen trees, um, western red cedars specifically, and hemlocks. It's kind of, those are like the anchors of this type of forest. And then you've got 
so many types of lichen, like those big, long kind of neon green curtains that dangle from trees um, and the mosses, of course, and then epiphytes, which are like these entire world into themselves of just like different funguses and mosses, like balls of them that just like hang from the tree. So, and then all the ferns along the forest floor, they're just incredible places. Um, this is where like mountain caribou live, you know, mm. really very, special. Very, yeah. Very cool. And this is a, an article that you wrote here about that. And then Oh, yeah. They inspired me to write about them for sure. And the yeah. photo you're showing right now, that's the first time I was in a coastal temperate rainforest in British Columbia. So these are some of those massive old growth giants. And I was just like, I couldn't believe these trees existed. And I couldn't believe they're being logged. I thought that old growth trees like this were protected in British Columbia. And they are to a certain extent if they reach a certain size, but mm. you know, like the ones we're looking at now wouldn't in this picture wouldn't have been protected just based on size alone, if you can believe that. So the bar is really high for one that wouldn't be logged. And a lot of times it's up to kind of citizen protests or citizen science movements to go out and take measurements of trees, for example, and to kind of report back the forestry industry. I think the picture you're showing right now is a, a clear cut, which is just, you know, it's, it's devastating to see pictures like this. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely wanted to write about this just to call attention to the fact that old growth trees are still being logged in British Columbia. I wrote about that quite extensively for outside magazine last year and some of the protests going on um, at Ferry Creek, for example. And then just here in the interior of British Columbia that we have this thing called an inland temperate rainforest and what that means and why they're special and what kind of life exists in them and why we want to make sure we don't cut them all down. Um, I actually, I went out to Fort Ferry Creek. I think you're showing some of those pictures now, which is where the heart of some of the old growth logging protests were happening. And that was on Vancouver Island off the west coast of British Columbia. And I went and embedded in some of those protest camps for a bit just to find out what's what's going on out here. I, of course, I brought uh, Pazzi and Jean-Francois because he wanted to be part of it, too. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. And uh, my daughter. Well, now, a little more Pazzi. I mean, seriously. When in, when in doubt. A lot of people had dogs up there with them also in my well, defense. When in doubt, more Pazzi. <laughs> I, I love this little clip that you sent. It's like, oh yeah, I'll just kind of follow along. Here we go. Yeah. It's like, yep. <laughs> the superstar. What what I'm gonna get to a little video here of of Posse because this is this is classic. <laughs> this is in my front yard. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, this is amazing. I love it. I love it. So clearly this dog loves the snow. <laughs> Does. I mean, she's my first little dog. I've had other dogs in my life, but they've generally been yellow Labrador retrievers. And okay. uh, Posse came about and this was a pandemic thing that she happened. And I just, I didn't know how to, I didn't treat her like a toy dog. I did, I've never had toy dogs. I just treated her like, a big dog. So I took her trail running. I took her in the snow. I took her skiing. I took her sailing. I, and because she was so small, I found I could put her on the end of my stand up paddleboard. I could take her stand up paddleboarding. And, right. and so she just, she doesn't know how small she is. And one thing I learned though about the snow, this is interesting. Well, maybe fast and loose with the term interesting. I think it's interesting. Most of these toy breed dogs, the reason why they have to get groomed is because their fur just keeps growing. It's mm. not because people who own little dogs are insane and like to take their dogs to little dog salons to get groomed, which was my kind of judgy perception prior to owning a dog. So no, right. their hair will literally keep growing until it's just, it's a giant, it won't stop. They'll be, it'll right. be a mop 10 feet long. She'll, she'll so she'll turn into a Wookiee. Exactly. So you have to actually trim their hair. So I do it myself. I, I trim Posse about once every three months or so. But another quality of this hair is it is like more like human hair. 
than what you think of a dog fur. So it keeps growing and it's not really as insulating. And so when you see little dogs dressed in little sweaters, again, not because little dog owners are crazy and like to dress up their dogs. Although, well, you could argue that is actually the case, but it, it's a functional reason too. They, anytime we're so cold that you would want to go out and put a toque on your head or a knit cap, as you say in the U.S., a beanie, you most likely would want to put your little dog in a sweater. They appreciate just that added warmth. So, so she does wear sweaters quite a bit these days. Yeah, yeah. And I, and so, I do get a kick of putting her in sweaters. So one month ago, you were <laughs> here. You were at the Great Barrier Reef. <laughs> what on earth were you doing there? Oh my gosh. Well, you know, with me, it's, it's not about where I'm going. It's so much as if there's a story that drives me to go somewhere. And yeah. there was such a cool story coming out of the Great Barrier Reef that I, I had to get there to tell this story. So I thought the Great Barrier Reef was dead. I mean, that's what you see in the news here in North America. Like it's all bleached out, right? It's like a white skeleton. Turns out the Great Barrier Reef is huge. It's like 1,200 miles long. And there's parts of it that have definitely been damaged by global temperatures rising, by ocean acidification, by the impacts of climate change, basically. But there's a lot of areas of the Great Barrier Reef that are, that are doing just fine. And even better, there's teams of scientists, marine biologists out there working to say, okay, how can we leverage areas of the reef that are healthy and doing fine and use them to help areas of the reef that have been damaged and could use a little help in regenerating? Because coral, it's actually really resilient and given the right circumstances, it can completely reflourish. And so there's a team of scientists out there for an annual event known as the Reef Spawn, which I like to think of as the greatest reproduction show on earth. All of those corals just like open up and release their eggs and their little sacks of sperm up into the water. And yeah. it all floats up. It's like being in an underwater snowstorm. It all, floats <laughs> up to the, it all floats up to the surface where it finds, you know, other sperms or eggs from a similar, you know, the same species of coral and it, it fertilizes. It kind of hangs out there on the surface of the water for a couple of days. It's orange. It's very visible. And then it, it kind of grows and then it settles back down, falls to the ocean floor and new coral is born. And so yeah. the idea was, can we harness some of this coral spawn, you know, get it into holding tanks, let it do its germination, that's the wrong word, thing, fertilization thing, because coral's actually not a plant, it's an animal. And then can we move it to reefs that are really in need of recovery and release it there to propagate the ocean floor? Such a cool project. It's being done in conjunction with one of the universities there, some of the tourism outfitter groups there who are really vested in keeping that coral healthy, and also the First Nations or Australian Aboriginal communities there. Um, those folks are known as sea rangers. And so they're the ones who kind of in charge of like the overall care of these ecosystems, just like Aboriginal Australians have been doing since time immemorial. So it's a, it was a great project. And I got to embed with this group out on a pontoon boat that had been turned into a floating laboratory like 60 miles off the coast of Cairns, which is a town in Queensland, and basically watch them do their work. It was. Yeah. And here's, a, and here's the uh, little coral nursery right here. Say this is going to be an upcoming article that you're going to pub publish or has this already been published? Yeah, this is going to be a story for Outside Magazine. Fantastic. Fantastic. And so I guess it's kind of, you mentioned it earlier with, with Posy, you, you mentioned that sometimes she goes sailing with you. You guys, uh, uh, in the summertime, you get out on a boat, right? Yeah, we took up sailing um, when we moved to Nelson because we're on a very large lake and there's a really vibrant sailing community here. And we click, quickly learned that sailing in conditions where there's a lot of mountains is actually really challenging because the way the wind plays off the mountains, it's actually almost easier to sail on the ocean. 
I mean, you're also having to factor in tides and other things in the ocean, but mountain lakes are a really good training ground for sailing. And so once we started feeling more comfortable there, I say we because my husband also got really into it. He, in fact, got even more into it than me. Like he started building his own sailboats. He's way sailing crazy. So anyways, we started trying it out on the coast in the ocean. And so and Posse, of course, comes everywhere with us. So she is a sailing dog. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I have to pop on over to some more photos from your trip uh, down <laughs> under. So this is in Tasmania. What were you doing down there? Oh my gosh, Tasmania. What a place. So Tasmania is one of the states in Australia. It's an, it's an island state. So it's basically an island state off of an island country. And something that's really part of the Tassie culture is this, this notion of bushwalking. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think bushwalking is popular in all of Australia, but especially Tasmania, because more than 50 percent of that island is covered in protected land, whether it's a national park or a protected zone. And so Tasmanians really like to take these areas in by foot. And usually you'll have eco lodges or kind of like temporary glamping sites set up specifically for the purpose of bushwalking. So I went out there on, I would say it's probably Tasmania's most popular bushwalk. It's called the Bay of Fires. It's in a national park and you basically walk kind of from one end of that crescent bay to the other. And it's got to be one of the most visually spectacular places on the planet because you've got this white sand beach, turquoise blue water, and these crazy rocks everywhere that are covered in bright orange lichen just like nothing you've ever seen. So I was drawn to it just for the aesthetics alone, but also because I learned they're doing some really cool citizen science there. Mm. So Australia, including Tasmania, has really been hit hard by bush fires recently. Right. And those fires are stronger, bigger, more frequent because of climate change. And so what's happening is it's decimating landscapes. And so one of the things that became really important is this idea of seed banking, which started in the UK at the, kind of the turn of the millennium, it became a thing. Like, hey, as added insurance against climate change, let's collect the seeds of all of the different fauna, excuse me, flora that, you know, each country has and, and store them. So the Tasmanian Royal, the Royal Tasmanian Botanical Society has a seed bank. And problem is collecting these seeds in places that are really remote or in the Alpine is really difficult. Do you send a team of botanists in there by helicopter, you know? Mm -hmm. But you've got these bushwalking tours going on where you've got people already out there with naturalist guides. So how about you just pair one botanist <laughs> and make that group already out there your team of citizen scientists to do the seed harvesting? Right. And again, you need hundreds of thousands of seeds for a successful seed banking harvest. And so the, the outfitter that I was out there with, the Tasmanian Walking Company, was doing just that. Mm. And I thought that was such an awesome idea. I'm like, I have to write about this. And so that's going to be a story in the April issue of Condé Nast Traveler magazine. That is so freaking cool. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and again, it's culture, right? It's active town culture. It's it like is. Absolutely. This is what they do in Tasmania. They go on bushwalks. Well, how yeah. can we use that to help the environment? Because this yeah. is also a culture that's being plagued with bushfires. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And if there was ever any doubt, so so your web page is, is right here. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty pretty obvious when you navigate to your website and you see the, some of the scrolling stuff that goes through. But when we click onto the, the articles and it sort of, it loads up all of the different stuff that you have written about over the years and gosh, even over the many years that I've known you and, and kind of followed your work. It's just, it's so amazing. You know, again, Condé Nast Traveler, Toronto Star, Kootenai, it just goes on and on and on. Outside Canadian Geographic. I love it. So much fun. <laughs> Thank you so much. 
uh, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's such an honor um, to reconnect with you and chat with you uh, about these things. It very much is in a culture of activity and the, the stories that you are writing uh, oftentimes have very, very meaningful uh narratives and storylines in them uh and, and you've you write about things that you're passionate about and that you care about and it's such an honor to have you here on the active towns podcast thank you so much jamie thank you john it's really great to be here and it's really fun talking about some of these things with someone so interested and enthusiastic about it thank you for that thank you all so much for tuning in i hope you enjoyed this episode with jamie moe and if you did please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, it'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just hit that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell for your notification preferences. And uh, hey, we'll be back next week with another episode. So until then, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <music>